This is Twit. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. Now, this bite is interesting because we talk a lot about the digital divide and you know internet access and making it useful and ab- available to people in like let's say rural areas or inner city urban areas or even in other countries that might not have the internet they need to to run their daily lives or even run their businesses. So I'm, I'm going to toss this over to Chibra because there's, there's a new interesting program going on that might just help. Chibra, what is it? Well, and I'm actually driving this one because otherwise it's going to sound like Luz tooting his own horn. This is actually a Microsoft <laughs> initiative. <laughs> and the cool thing is I it's actually the whole concept is very near and dear to my heart. I've been part of a wireless internet service provider. Now, for those of you that weren't able to make it to Wispapalooza, which is a conven- physical con- convention in Las Vegas, put on by the Wireless Internet Service Provider Association. Now, we, we did have um, their CEO on um, a little while back. In fact, that just for your reference, it was Claude Akins and was back in episode 345. Now, so here's, here's the trick. We all agree that the internet and access to the internet is a very big deal, no matter where you live, whether it's in America, um, West Africa, South Africa, doesn't matter. The internet is the way a lot of things are happening. Now, not only is it education, it's also business, being able to get to the information, get to the products that you're trying to um, sell or buy. So, it's an important thing. So what's happening is Microsoft has an initiative. They're calling it Airband. And um, what I'd actually like to do is there's a map that we can bring up. That This is very obviously U.S.-centric, but it shows where the Microsoft Airband project is really starting to happen within the co- continental U.S. and, of course, America, um, Alaska, and Hawaii. So the... Colors, the dark blue or the lighter blue, is where Microsoft Airband is really starting to happen. So as part of the article that Microsoft did, there is a really cool um, couple of paragraphs. Quote, last year, a team of Amish-owned horses dragged the load up a ridge near Essex, New York. It was a normal scene for rural America, straight out of a Norman Rockwell painting, except they were Rearing telecommunications equipment to connect the local community to the internet. Now, Essex is barely 12 miles across the lake from Burlington, Vermont, but broadband is scarce. In our increasingly digital and interconnected world, broadband is as important as electricity or water. Rural communities without broadband face higher unemployment rates and see fewer educational and economic opportunities. For the women overseeing the horses, Beth Schiller, CEO of CV Wireless LLC, this is a solvable problem. Together with Microsoft's Airband Initiative, she's bringing connectivity to her community. Now, the article goes on to say that in the summer of 2017, Microsoft launched the Airband Initiative to bring wireless broadband connectivity, well, actually broadband connectivity to people living in underserved rural areas. Now, I think we can all agree that a lot of these rural communities are not served by the big ISPs because it's too expensive. You know, the typical cost for a utility pole is about $5,000 to put in the ground. So when you start adding those up by the thousands of poles you need to bring internet into rural communities, especially farm communities where your next neighbor might be several miles down. Um, I can understand why the giant ISPs are saying, well, maybe this isn't a good business case. So what's happening is the wireless internet service providers, and in this case, Microsoft and a few other folks are stepping in and saying, well, if the business case isn't going to work, let's start saying, let's make the world a better place. And so what's happening is there's lots of initiatives happening. Now, I, I will also say that these folks are doing an amazing job. And it doesn't take much now 
to light up a wireless internet service provider. So I'm actually building one in Honolulu with a friend. And the idea is you somehow figure out a way of getting a traditional commercial internet um, link into a location. Putting up a tower is not as hard as it used to be. In fact, there are actually crank up towers that you can buy out of a catalog and crank it up and get a radio maybe 30 or 40 feet up in the air. And that's usually enough to go and serve a fairly good sized neighborhood. So we've got lots and lots of mom and pop shops. In fact, I met a lot of them um, at Wispapalooza where they're just trying to light up their neighborhood. And mighty good thing that is. Now, one of the other things that were happening that a lot of folks were worried about is how the heck do you get across large streams, small rivers, or lakes? And that's going to be interesting. So anyway... Um, WISPA, the Wireless Internet Service Provider Association, is doing a lot of the education. So teaching people how to light up a WISP. In fact, um, I met a gentleman named Kevin Myers. And Kevin is a really interesting engineer. He does an amazing number of educational sessions at WISPA Palooza. And he also does a whole bunch of them online, teaching people the basics now, there's actually two fairly good size corporations, manufacturers, actually, that really and truly aim in on the small service providers. One is Ubiquity and another one is Microtik, which ought to be really interesting. Now, what's happening is these folks are trying to take advantage of the unlicensed bands. So without having to mess around with all the specialized permits, um, these WISP are actually starting to bring up, bring up services a lot faster. In fact, um, the U.S. federal government is even providing a boatload of money um, for people bringing the internet, so bridging the digital divide, for Native Americans. So this has got to be fun. So I'm going to lean back towards the Microsoft project, and um, I, I expect Lou to squirm a little bit, hopefully not too much. But Lou, you threw this at me last night, and we both agree this is a great story. But how big an impact, how how much have you seen of Microsoft resources being used to build these types of things? So, you know, I personally haven't seen anything because I work in the office division, so I don't work with this group, but I have heard uh, a lot about this program. And I can tell you that they are, they have super ambitious goals here because they've, they started the previous year and they're, they're looking to provide up to 3 million people, more people uh, in undeserved rural areas, broadband internet by July 4, 2022. So they, they have less than a year left and they've been moving Quick, quite swiftly here. I think they've they've partnered with a lot of different private sector uh, organizations and capital investment firms to to make this uh, possible. And that's really their idea here. Is the, the idea here is they they bring together private sector capital investments and new technologies to help bring that technology and that availability to uh, to broadband into rural areas uh, and to help with those financial uh, and regulatory support there. Um, you know, I, I've actually it's interesting because they have three kind of pillars that they focus on. They're focusing obviously in rural America, um, especially. Um, they're also focusing on areas uh, for expanding in U.S. cities, uh, especially in urban areas where might, they might not have uh, a good broadband connectivity, as well as in um, unconnected markets um, outside the U.S. as well, sub, sub, uh, sub uh, Saharan Africa and Asia. Uh, they're they're partnering with a lot of people in Kenya. I've seen actually, uh, and for projects. So I think you know the interesting thing here is they're they're focusing on uh, where where the program needs to happen. Now I, the, I I I'm not sure if you can show this, Ann, but there's a really cool Power BI report. Uh, but the reason why I want to show it is not because of the how cool the report is. It's because it shows the divide between what FCC is reporting on how many people actually don't have broadband versus what Microsoft has been doing research on here. And what it's showing is that 14 million, if you click on the next box down there where it says uh, broadband, but yeah, that one there, there's the comparison and it shows that 
the FCC is indicating that only 14.5 million people don't have broadband. But Microsoft actually, and their data indicates that actually the true number is closer to roughly 120 million people. So I think there's a little bit of a divide there, variance in, in what the and what people have. And I think that's why programs like these will help, help hopefully bridge that. Now that, again, they're to try and do 3 million by next year. Again, that doesn't put a huge dent in the 120 million, but again, it's, it's getting closer. So I think that this is, this is a, I think really great program and I think we need more of them. Yeah. And so I'm going to toot the horn for the WISPA group. Um, there is actually a getting started. So Lou actually asked me a really interesting question the other night and he says, how hard is it to start up a WISP? And the answer really is not as hard as it you might think. So even things like having to provision. So if someone goes and says, I want a connection in a building that you've already run fiber to, or you've run wireless to, or something, taking that router, scanning the barcode, getting it ready so that it has some address space and set up the billing and all that, that there's um, two or three fairly good size uh, pieces of software that are available. Some are cloud-based, some are on-premise based, or some are either, where you can literally set up a person's internet link just by scanning a barcode, sending it into the system, and it'll start provisioning. All the things that these giant ISPs have been doing fairly, you know, reasonably well, you know, they're good at taking your money. So the, um, the idea is... If someone wanted to start it up and to hit an underserved area, like, for instance, my partner and I are looking at doing um, Internet provide, provisos for the two and three story walk ups that have under 40 customers in it. And those are the ones that a lot of the large ISPs aren't interested in because they can't make enough money. So I think it's going to be a combination of really cool um, initiatives like what Microsoft's doing. Um, even though Facebook has had some problems, they're actually doing some good stuff. Uh, Google's been doing a lot of good stuff. And obviously the WISPA folks are doing some good stuff. So maybe there's hope. Now, one of these fine days off in the not hopefully not too distant future, we're going to go and have our wireless curmudgeon on, um, Heather Williams, a.k.a. Mo Beta Wi-Fi. And she's been delving into a um, startup. And I'm thinking maybe some new technology is going to be on the horizon very soon that's going to make it even easier for wireless internet service providers to get lit up. So here's crossing our fingers that we're going to be able to bridge that digital divide a lot faster. Now, I'm going to let Mr. Kurt have the last say on this article. And... Obviously, it's, there's a lot of discrepancy between what the FCC thinks has coverage and what Microsoft has coverage, um, their, their study did. But from the large C-suite, what kinds of cool things might we be able to someday hold our breath for if Internet really and truly did become ubiquitous? How big an impact, what kinds of impacts might we have on Enterprise America? Well, I think it could be a big impact. And I, I wanted to, to look at, at those two numbers, and, and you don't have to put it back up. But the FCC, if you look carefully at their chart, they talked about the number of Americans where it was not available. And that's a, a relatively small number. Microsoft's number looked at the number of people who are not using broadband. And what that says to me, um, thank you, Ant, um, is that there is a huge gap covering about 106 million people where broadband is technically available, but it's not affordable. And to me, that's a critical thing. You know, we, we've talked a lot over the years about the digital divide, about the broadband gap, things like that. It covers both where it is available and how affordable it is. And the number on affordability is going to be different 
depending on precisely where you live. And I think in a lot of rural areas, we do get into that affordability gap because in many places, there are rural families who are able to live in a rural environment pretty well at an income level that is much less than that required to live in one of the big cities. So they may have a perfectly reasonable life, but not have lots of cash left over for $100 a month broadband. So what I am hoping is that through the wireless initiatives, through what could be part of an infrastructure deal, if it ever makes it through Congress, through a lot of different new technologies, we can close not only the availability gap, but the affordability gap and not leave people who are forced to deal with nothing but essentially broadband, uh, I'm sorry, dial-up speeds in what has become a broadband economy. Because while they may technically be part of this new economy, realistically, they are at best second-class citizens.